So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Carly. We are coming at you from the Marine Environmental Education Center, located at the Carpenter House in Hollywood Beach, Florida. So if you guys have been here before, we've been doing these webinar series uh, for the past couple months, just trying to expand and um, reach all sorts of people, which has been really awesome with the Zoom. Um, so we are still closed and we will probably be remaining closed through the rest of this month. So keep an eye out for our webinar series to continue every Tuesday and Thursday at 3 p.m. Um, today, we are super lucky to have Dr. Lopez talking to us today. He is a microbiologist at Nova Southeastern University where his research focus is on genomes, genes, microbes, and evolution. So for the past 25 years, his work has applied genomics tools to address various specific questions in marine biology, invertebrate microbial symbiosis, microbial ecology, forensics, gene expression, and systematics. So today, Dr. Lopez is gonna to talk to us all about his research and some of the things that he has learned along his way. As always, if you guys have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat and we will get to them at the end of the presentation. So Dr. Lopez, whenever you are ready, go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Carly, for that introduction. And hello, everybody. I can't see you all, but uh, I trust you're out there. And uh, I appreciate this opportunity to talk about uh, the research in my lab. Um, as Carly mentioned, it's, uh, it's been uh, uh, a pretty uh, long road. I've been at uh, uh, NOVA for 13 years now. Uh, since 2007. And uh, what I want to tell you in just various kind of quick snippets um, is uh, some of my main interest and in, uh, kind of latest research uh, highlights. And uh, there is a focus on microbiology, as, as, uh, as Carly mentioned, but my main training is in the genetics and genomics. And then I use that to, uh, to study microorganisms in the marine habitats. Um, and then um, within that context is also to look at marine invertebrates, the uh, spineless organisms, which host a lot of microorganisms. Uh, so corals fit into that uh, group, sponges fit into that group. So I'll talk a little bit about this. You heard a few buzzwords there like symbiosis, uh, genomics, and microbes. So um, that kind of fits into the broad uh, kind of spectrum of my lab. As I mentioned, I've uh, been at NOVA for uh, 13 years, but I was also at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution for 10 years before that, where a main focus was uh, marine sponges um, and their diet biodiversity, uh, the, uh, their filter feeders, and I'll talk a little bit more about sponges uh, specifically in a few minutes. Um, but then I branched out to other, other organisms within, uh, uh, within the marine realm from coral reefs to uh, deep sea. Uh, a main denominator of this is the water, of course, and uh, what's in the water. And looking at uh, more recently, uh, water quality and using at the center of this is uh, the interest in biodiversity and using genetics to characterize that diversity at the molecular level. You got the spinning DNA molecule here in the middle. Well, that's kind of uh, the focus of our lab work is, uh, is looking at reading the, the DNA sequences and the information molecule because that is the, uh, the blueprint of life from something as, as small as a microorganism or a virus to a larger organism like corals and uh, uh, tunicates, which I'll talk about. Um, I did give the, a part of this lecture a, a few weeks ago uh, as part of our school's recruitment. So I'm gonna be kind of piecing together some of that as well and that intro uh, and expand a little bit more in certain areas. But our lab is focused, uh, as I mentioned, on the biodiversity, meaning the diversity across many different habitats and organisms, but you can also partition it into two major kind of research foci uh, and interest. And uh, um, the first one is the small microorganisms, also known as prokaryotes, because they they don't have a true nucleus. And uh, again, I don't consider myself a really uh, formal microbiologist. I just kind of use the tools to study the microbes. So that's what you see on the left here. And then the, the larger organisms are the eukaryotes, which actually do have nuclei. They have bigger genomes and they comprise things from algae all the way up to blue whales. So 
again, I only focus, we mostly focus on just invertebrates in our labs that are found in some of these habitats. And um, just a quick kind of plug, and because uh, many of you have seen this, but uh, my lab is in the, uh, the Guy Harvey Oceanographic Center. Um, and this is here, uh, a picture of it on, um, uh, at uh, Mysel Johnson Park, right there on the uh, Port Everglades Inlet. Beautiful, great place to work, great colleagues. We have uh, state-of-the-art laboratories, mostly focused uh, on, uh, on marine habitats, marine uh, ecology and uh, biology. And then our lab, again, applies uh, genetics within this, this context. Um, the great thing is we're 15, 30 minutes from the reef, uh, or you can just swim to the reef from, the, from, uh, from our labs and uh, get uh, access to various types of habitats and organisms. Um, we have seawater, uh, running seawater tanks for experiments. These are kind of old photos, but we really expanded on what we can do. And if you've probably heard several uh, really nice research uh, seminars discussing some of the previous work that's been done. So again, just to our focus is, uh, is I'll start off on the, the prokaryotic side, uh, the, the microbial side and what we've been doing there. And we've kind of jumped on the bandwagon in terms of uh, what's called the Earth Microbiome Project. And this came about uh, 10, 15 years ago, um, actually started as an offshoot of the Human Microbiome Project. And microbiomes is a fancy term for just a community of microbes. So what uh, many scientists, microbiologists wanted to know is, you know, what is the diversity of microbes uh, in a particular habitat um, or around the world? So from, from uh, terrestrial habitats, which can encompass deserts to rainforests, uh, down to different aquatic habitats from lakes to rivers to the ocean. I mean, microbes inhabit most of these different habitats. And uh, using genetics, uh, we are getting a better picture of what those microbes do. Uh, so just, this is a, a review paper from a few years ago, very well done kind of summary of the different habitats here that that are found. I'm going to see if I can use my pointers. Uh, I want to point things out here, but this just uh, this graph here just shows that you could actually divide the, the microbiomes, these communities, into symbiotic communities that live in association with bigger organisms like plants and animals. Here, uh, these are host-associated symbiont communities, or ones that are kind of more free-living that just live in open water or uh, with with non-living organisms and. This was a good summary because it, it sampled across the world, many different biomes or habitats and put together that summary. So again, we were kind of uh, working within that context in my lab and we used some of the latest tools that were developed by the Earth Microbiome Project and Human Microbiome Project to, to understand what these microbes may be doing uh, or what they, their identity was in various types of organisms. So we started out with sponges, which was uh, my main focus there for many years. And then we moved on to some other organisms like sharks and anglerfish. We did a couple of collaborations with uh, uh, human subjects uh, and even a, a bat study uh, from colleagues, uh, M. Teeling in Ireland, for example, was interested in bats that uh, could, could the microbiome of bats be contributing to their longevity? And some species have relatively long lifespans compared to other mammals in that group. So these are just uh, some of the microbiome studies we've been carrying out. And you're, you're welcome to take a look at those in more detail um, in our publications. So I'll, I won't touch upon those in, in, in great depth. And, Another project, which is non-symbiotic, which I also can't talk about in, in great depth at this point, partially because we just are in the middle of it. We don't have any conclusions, but we do have a, a project ongoing now to understand the, uh, the microbial basis of blooms that we see here in Florida. And this is a, a really, uh, of course, important uh, concern for, for many of us here who use the uh, the, the waterways, uh, 
uh, every few years, we get something called these harmful algal blooms. Some of them are based on cyanobacteria or blue-green algae. And you see a picture here, you know, when you see a massive bloom, uh, some of those could be toxic uh, uh, toxin producers. And so that's not good for the habitat and even humans uh, with respiratory problems, affects our drinking resources, drinking water. And so there's dynamics there in those communities, microbiome communities that we wanna better understand. Uh, we think some of those can be fed by nutrients, temperature changes, um, and we focused on Lake Okeechobee, nutrient inputs. And we, again, are, uh, are, we are midway through this and applying metagenomics and genomic resources and methods to try to better understand that. So hopefully, you know, stay tuned. Uh, maybe I can, uh, by next year, we might have more answers on the microbial community of, of uh, the lake and uh, the, uh, the predictions and the dynamics of Lake Okeechobee algal blooms. For now though, I'll go back to symbiosis in the marine habitats. And uh, again, just applying genetics and genomics has just been uh, really uh, very uh, uh, fortuitous and amazing that we've been in this, this growth phase for the, the field. Uh, it's exciting and daunting in some ways just because of the, the various tools and uh, uh, the challenges of applying these tools. It's very computational. Uh, so we, we need not only biologists to be well versed in these techniques, but we need uh, computer scientists or, or people who are uh, adept at programming uh, and handling large amounts of data. So that's kind of an underlying thread through, through a lot of this work. But the, uh, the first thing is uh, when I talk about symbiosis is this, it's a fundamental aspect of life and uh, something that I've been interested in as well for, for many years, uh, even going back to my days at Harbor Branch, is that you know, the symbiosis is, is what drives many types of, of uh, ecosystems and organismal physiologies. And I present this in my uh, uh, undergraduate microbiology class is that when you look at symbiosis, it's not a static, um, phenomenon as well, that you have an interaction of the host as well as this symbiont, single-celled organism typically, and um, we live in association with these partners for years. Um, and it can be something that's beneficial, which we call mutualism. It's a win-win for both parties, the symbiont and the host, or you can have a neutral type of association, or you can uh, evolve where the, the same individual might change into a more detrimental uh, association where the parasite or the microbe turns or becomes uh, a negative effect because the host, say, immunology degrades due to illness or weakness. And then you can have true pathogens, which are foreign invaders, which uh, can damage and uh, become unhealthy for the organism. So these are the dynamics of, of microbes. But I also emphasize in, in our, our classwork is that, you know, microbes are essential to the planet. And I, I just like this quote that Lynn Margulis, an early pioneer of symbiosis came out that, you know, this is what kind of sets our planet apart from the rest of the solar system is that we're the only uh, uh, planet with a living atmosphere. Uh, you see this, this great blue, blue marble here uh, with a lot of water, breathable uh, oxygen, and many of that, many of those qualities are due to microorganismal uh, effects, their, their functions. So ecosystem services is one way to put it. Uh, compare that to the moon nearby and there is no atmosphere. There's no uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, degradation of uh, uh, elemental cycling. This is not present. And uh, this kind of led to uh, a, a kind of a question and uh, concept we came up with a few years ago that, you know, look at the, look at the, the, the what we have on Mars. And uh, although there are uh, movements and uh, programs to try to go back into space and maybe settle and colonize Mars, Mars is very similar to the moon in some ways. It's in terms of, we do not yet know 
if there's any living microorganisms on that planet. There is an atmosphere, but it's mostly carbon dioxide. So um, we had a, a visitor from NASA a few years ago, gave the seminar that the Mars program was being reinitiated in 2016. And that got us to thinking, well, there's, there's really no, no microbial life on this planet. So uh, we wrote an opinion piece, which got a lot of interesting uh, uh, attention last year. And uh, I can send you this, this link later, or we could uh, give you some, some more details. But we just, uh, again, no data to, to support it, but we came up with this thought experiment that you need to have microbes first if you're truly gonna colonize a planet like Mars. Um, it's gonna take a lot of effort to get there. Um, I think we need to like develop a systematic uh, program to think about what microbes we might wanna bring eventually. Um, in, a, in a type of research program. And we're not really meaning to contaminate the planet. That's a kind of a different way of looking at it, but we want to work together with microbiologists. And this was a type of gift to the microbiology community because they, they weren't always included, uh, for example, in, the, in colonization or space exploration um, uh, programs. So this... Uh, this uh, opinion piece was was part of this uh, this discussion to to start looking at reevaluating planetary protection plans, develop new ones, including microorganisms, and um, even uh, going back to the moon, which is now on the slate. That people want to start it's nearby, closer. Do you want to go back there? Well, you know there were uh, seven manned uh, missions, six or seven, I think, that went to the moon. And at that point, we knew very little about microbiomes, but um, you might have to revisit some of that. What was the, the effects of, of those uh, um, leftovers there on the moon? They did not have a uh, atmosphere, as I mentioned. So those, those types of uh, criteria need to be looked at. And in our paper, we kind of outline something called the uh, planetary or proactive inoculation uh, or introduction uh, protocols, which still need to be developed. Uh, but we can do this on this planet safely. That's kind of the idea is we need to learn more about what are the hardiest microorganisms that could possibly go up uh, for a, uh, a planetary mission. We need to study more of those, look at them as a community, because in, in essence, all microbes live in communities, mixed uh, uh, populations. They are not what you see on a petri dish, which is a pure uh, type of specimen. So feel free to look at that in more depth. Um, again, a type of aside, because I'll go back here to to uh, to our oceans in the marine uh, area, which to many is could be considered a type of alien atmosphere, uh, alien habitat as well. I mean, many people have not seen the bottom of the ocean, and. Um, and, and the deep waters. It is, it is alien in many respects, and you could learn a lot from that. Um, these are still areas that are inhabited by microbes and uh, relatively uncharacterized organisms. Um, and that's another thing we kind of pushed on the, uh, the opinion piece is that we have a lot of life on this planet, which is uh, not very well known. And yet we're going out into kind of outer space, which has no evidence so far of any uh, uh, biodiversity. And um, it would be nice if we kind of spend a little bit more time here, protect what we have, understand what we have a little bit better. Uh, because right now we only have one, one planet with, which is hosting all this life. And we want to understand those, those interactions. So I show a few pictures here the, of, uh, to try to underline this symbiosis phenomenon which starts off in coral reefs, where you have a coral which is in, in a deep partnership with a single-celled algae, which photosynthesizes. Uh, our own human gut is populated with hundreds of species of microorganisms. And most of those are beneficial. That's another thing is, you know, most microbes do not cause disease, right? They are living with us, on us, on our skin, in our gut, and they're creating vitamins or helping helping digest uh, nutrients and food. You have a deep whale carcass here that's uh, been on the 
the floor of the, uh, the, the ocean for 10, maybe 50 years, slowly degrading, and it requires a microorganism and uh, symbiotic worms to break down that, that very large organism over many years. Um, I wanted to mention this uh, new project. We just are just getting started. Uh, and it was uh, brought about by funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Very excited about this. We are part of uh, one of 10 hubs, research hubs, which have been, uh, been tapped. And uh, what they wanna do is look at, at uh, 10 symbiotic uh, co consortia. And uh, they all have a sp specific theme to look at the symbiosis and look at the genomes of all these symbionts. So each hub will have 50 hosts and 50 symbionts that will be sequenced for their whole genome uh, information, their whole capacity. This is whole genomes, which can be very large or very small, but it's, a, uh, it's gonna be at a high uh, level high chromosome level capacity, which is the high quality genome sequencing. And um, this is really the first of its kind that's been done. And so we're, we're very happy to be part of this project. And um, we decided on a topic called photosymbiosis. And these would be, uh, this is a focus on organisms or invertebrates, which have uh, like corals, a partner that photosynthesizes. That means it's able to use light energy to uh, produce sugar or uh, carbohydrates. And many different types of uh, invertebrates do this. So we've been learning about this. Uh, I'm gonna mention the, the, our Giga uh, partnership here in a few minutes, but the uh, Moore Foundation in partnership with the Wellcome Sanger Institute in, uh, in Great Britain, or I mean the, the UK uh, is involved in in supporting this work. They're gonna do all of the sequencing in the UK. And in our hub, we have chosen or in the middle of choosing these 50 host species that again, can take light energy, which is uh, sustainable and on the surface at least, can produce enough energy to uh, create and sustain various types of habitats. Very basic formula here from converting carbon dioxide to oxygen and organic material. And we've now identified uh, over 10 collaborators from around the world that uh, can provide us the expertise in their particular organismal group, such as uh, A-seals, um, Sacaglossin uh, snails, these uh, solar powered snails, which eat uh, algae and then incorporate the chloroplast into their tissue giant clams, another mollusk, uh, sponges, and uh, hopefully a tunicate and hydra later on to be added. So it's just an amazing spectrum of, of different invertebrates here that can practice and use photosynthesis to, to uh, generate their, uh, uh, their lifestyle. Uh, so we're gonna learn about that once we read the genomes of these organisms. And of course, corals, which many of you probably know, Corals, again, dependent on algae. And the only reason we have a reef is because they have algae in their tissue that car carries out photosynthesis. We have other types of cnidarians and uh, uh, other types of corals that, are, that can't create reefs because they don't have this photosynthesis. This is uh, actually a local uh, Sacaglossin, a uh, Elysia, which we can find right here on our coral, on our, uh, Florida Keys, Let's see if I can turn on the, uh, the there's the, uh, yeah, we got a bunch of these right here. And uh, they're, uh, they're present in pretty high numbers. Um, and they've already, you see the very green, they've incorporated the, the algae and the algae are still photosynthesizing. Actually, so you can keep them in, uh, in a tank for a limited amount of time without feeding them and they will stay alive just from the, the solar, solar power. Um, another project we just finished, not really a photosynthetic, but I just wanted to highlight that we had a genome here from a bryozoan. And uh, this was a, a, a recent project completed with collaborators 
from Russia and uh, Jason Kwan from the University of Wisconsin. Those of you who might be interested, this is what it looks like. It's a small, uh, really inconspicuous uh, invertebrate, but it produces a compound called bryostatin, which has been known to have anti-tumor effects. So uh, it's been of interest to, to many uh, organisms here. And here we see it's also known as a moss invertebrate or a moss animal. Uh, they use filtration. And again, they uh, produce this very interesting compound called bryostatin. It's a polyketide, uh, very complex biosynthesis. I won't go into this in detail. We did the genomes, but it's again, just underlying that it is a photosymbiotic association because actually part of the, uh, the product itself is produced by a microorganism. Um, so we had just finished that. And uh, what I wanna talk about now, another invertebrate is the sponges. So marine sponges are a group that has been a, a major focus of my laboratory um, uh, since my postdoctoral days. And um, it was of interest because for several reasons shown here that it is, uh, there's many thousands of species which very few people know about. Most of them are marine. Uh, they can live in shallow waters from uh, coral reefs down to the deep sea. And um, they also carry out symbiosis, living with microbes, bacteria, fungi, and algae in their tissues. And as I just mentioned, uh, for the bryozoan, uh, sponges are known for producing natural products. So these are biochemical compounds, fairly complex that can be used as antibiotics, anti-tumors, uh, agents, possible therapeutics. And so they've been a focus of the pharmaceutical industry for many years. Uh, one thing is they're, they don't move, they don't swim, so they're pretty easy to collect. Uh, they can be as uh, colorful as this one uh, on, uh, on uh, mangroves. But they also are known to, or thought to be the oldest animal group. And there's a controversy that, that arose there, mostly from, the, uh, uh, from genetic evidence. When genome sequencing became more, uh, more easy in the, the past few years and, and uh, uh, facilitated by genome high throughput sequencing, a group looked at uh, this other invertebrate group and looked at the tenophores, also known as, known as comb jellies, generated a large volume of genomic data there and started to put together what we call phylogenetic trees. These were evolutionary trees or relationships. And they started putting uh, the genes with various types of physiological data. And what they found was that it's possible that the sponges are not the actual true ancestor of all animals. Uh, a, uh, another hypothesis was that the sponges lost some of this capacity or that the branch leading to the sponges lost neurons and muscles, which were actually found in the tenophores or comb jellies. And this led to this alternative hypothesis. This is um, kind of a, a current debate. Uh, it goes back and forth. It's uh, one of the issues is that it's, you know, we weren't there when this, this branching might've happened 500, 600 million years ago. So it's, it's very difficult. We only have what we see as count as living extant uh, organisms. And we can only put together and infer what might have happened at this, uh, this stage. So it's an interesting scientific question if you uh, want to pursue this, because more evidence is needed. Uh, and uh, we continue to add more genetic data to, to fuel this, this debate for sponges or tenophores. So with regard to the sponges, again, it's a very simple organism. Its uh, lifestyle is just filtering water for its food. Uh, like most of them are not photosymbiotic, as I mentioned in, 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 uh, from that other group. So they're filtering water from, um, these, from its surrounding uh, seawater through a coanocyte chamber in there where it traps different uh, particles uh, dissolved organic matter. It's a generally an, a single single uh, a, a, a unicurrent, and then the uh, outflow goes through one oscula. Then um, there's the particulates are trapped 
so they have various types of cell types like choanocytes and amoebocytes, but they don't have true tissue. Now, here's the pumping in action. Most sponges are going to be pumping and filtering this uh, seawater. Uh, one of uh, the uh, uh, organisms we started looking at was a sponge called Cliona. And you see it here. And if you've been snorkeling off our reefs, you might have noticed this. Um, it's actually a, an interesting sponge and uh, of importance. So uh, my first PhD student took this up uh, about six years ago or seven years ago, actually, and uh, wanted to look at the physiology of Cliona in more detail. Very uh, important because it's known as the uh, coral killer. As you can see here, what it does is it, it settles on a coral and starts eventually killing the coral over time. It's an excavating sponge and it eventually takes over the whole colony. Um, this is a, just wanted to show the sponges overall that you know they've been known through antiquity, uh, like these, uh, the, these, this pottery shown from Crete, for example, uh, they've, they've been pictured there, of course, using bath sponges as a uh, utility. That's very important. And uh, that's, uh, again, been collected over, over many years here. Um, they also are found in the deep sea. So this is a, a YouTube from a deep sea sponge, probably one of the largest sponges ever sh shown. Very few predators of this, I guess. Um, so this is a... Um, one that's continually growing. And as I mentioned, the sponges are uh, very, very good host for microorganisms. They eat those that they graze, but then there is also a proportion or a fraction of those microbes which stay within the tissue and they just live with the host uh, for years, if not their, their total lifetime. So as you snorkel on our, our reefs, you see something like this. This is a, a coral reef, but with the corals live many different types of sponges. You can look at a cross, at a cross section of a tissue of, uh, of sponge shown here, and you see many different types of microbes just here in the electron micrograph. But we don't really know those in, in detail unless we start looking at the genetics. So we had a project uh, that was uh, uh, initiated a few years ago with various types, very collabor various collaborators from 20 different countries. They had their own uh, kind of favorite sponge they were looking at. We then applied genetic methods called 16S to look at those in detail. And what they found in the summer here is just all these, these sponges put together, 81 different species, that generally many species had their own specific community of sponges. I mean, community of microbes this is very unique to that particular um, uh, sponge species. So as I mentioned, uh, my PhD student, Andia uh, chavez Fenegra focused on the Cliona, uh, the coral reef killer here. I'm not gonna go into detail here. We uh, carried on uh, with Cole Eason, uh, postdoc in my lab, and they really looked at this in more detail, uh, what that sponge, microbiome did, um, what were its effects because we had samples from all across the Caribbean uh, to look at this in more detail. And we tried to link it to the actual physiology of the sponge. This is its reproductive pattern. It uh, generally kind of reproduced nearby, so it had restricted dispersal. And yet we wanted to look at, you know, what was the microbial community across all of these different uh, populations of the clion itself. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here and kind of go kind of to the uh, overall gist of the of the, the study which was published uh, by Cole uh, last year. What we saw was that there were just a, a, a about 60 or so very very uh, uh, common microbes that were found and they could be partitioned into either ones that are found in the environment, ones that were enriched in the sponge, all sponges, and then ones that were really unique to the genus Cliona. And then one just Cliona specific, Cliona delitrix, which is this, this orange coral killer, um, which was is shown in purple here. Well, 
What's interesting is the relative abundance of the clinospecific microbes tended to be much less uh, in abundance compared to ones that are found across all sponges. And then that there was also probably a very important environmental as well as host specific factoring that uh, was involved in structuring those microbial communities. Again, I'm not gonna go into detail on this particular study, um, but it has implications for what the microbes may do uh, within sponges, within this species, as well as other species of sponges. And again, as, as simple as what a sponge might be, it is actually, um, there's a lot of diversity in it because you have this type of sponge, which is excavating, but you have bigger sponges with, with a lot more tissue. Um, and then, as I mentioned, they can inhabit the deep sea as well as uh, coral reefs and more shallow sponges. So I'm gonna go, this last part here of this talk, I wanted to kind of focus away from sponges, another group of organisms. And I got into the genomics of various invertebrates from um, this study here called the Genome 10K study. And this was initiated by my uh, doctoral mentor, Steve O'Brien. If you get a chance to, to listen to some of, of his talks, he initiated a genome sequencing project um, in 2009 to look at vertebrate genomes. We got together after he moved to Florida and uh, helped promote uh, a genome 10K for invertebrates. And he talked me into kind of helping lead this and we uh, christened it GIGA for the Global Invertebrate Genome Alliance. And uh, we've had several meetings after our initial meeting in, at uh, NOVA in 2013. We had several workshops and uh, overall we're, we're uh, really kind of growing as a community. We were meant to be a, a grassroots organization. We started out that way and we've been growing in number. Um, we want to encompass the uh, genomics of multiple invertebrate animals. And this is just a, a snapshot of what you see in terms of the phenotypic diversity. It's pretty amazing when you look at it from, from snails to corals, to shrimp, to, to mollusks. I mean, we have, uh, these are typically cryptic, uh, inaccessible organisms where we have very few specialists uh, who understand and can identify a specific species. Um, we have and, and it, uh, you know, thousands of different species in a group. Some of the species have large genomes, large breadth. And so GIGA was meant to maybe introduce and facilitate uh, the genomic study of these various groups here. So um, we are a, uh, a, we've now become a nonprofit organization and uh, we, uh, we appreciate any support you can, uh, can lend to this because we're, we have a, as our focus, uh, the sequencing of these various genomes and then the training of early career scientists and students who can take on the analysis of these very novel non-model genomes. Um, so again, I invite you to kind of look at that in more depth. And the big picture of this is if we understand the genomes of a invertebrate that lives on a coral reef, we might better understand the, uh, the ecosystem itself. Remember ecosystems are made up of multiple organisms into populations and communities. They're interacting with each other, other at the ecological level. This can lead to the evolution of the overall system and these habitats um, and the organisms. So that's the basis of why we do genomics. And uh, we also, through GIGA, want to fill in gaps because as I mentioned, again, most, most uh, many people don't realize the organisms are there. And when you look at an evolutionary tree like this, which is actually all of the animal phyla that we know of on the planet, there are about 30 different animal phyla. Uh, again, it includes sponges down here, but it also includes uh, you know, the vertebrates, and the, which is the craniata. Um, and then you have all these other uh, groups that uh, have very little information at the genetic level. So that's what's shown in red. If you look at the red here, that's all the genomes that have been made. And this was as of uh, five years ago. We've gotten a few more, but generally most of them have very little representation in genome databases. 
And uh, this was an interesting paper here because of the title that, you know, you look at invertebrates as this icky, non-charismatic group of organisms. Very few people care about a, a Nemertean worm, for example, or an annelid or a bryzoan. And yet this is what Giga was meant to kind of do is uh, let's turn some attention and let's start looking at the genomes of these, these uncharacterized and uh, uh, inaccessible organisms. Um, and yet, again, as I showed in the other picture, if you look at these things, they are not really non-charismatic at all. Um, you've heard about octopus, for example, they're probably one of the smartest animals. They seem to be able to learn. At the genetic level, we found that they have a lot of neurological genes, which match to uh, the higher vertebrates. Those are very interesting and, and we're just kind of scratching the surface there. The crustaceans, uh, shrimp and crabs, these feed millions of people around the world. So we need to understand the fishery aspects of these various, these various organisms. You have other organisms, um, feather stars, other types of worms that live uh, on various habitats. The hydra, which we're gonna try to include in our uh, more uh, project, this is uh, possibly, it's, it's thought to be a uh, immortal organism or some species. It's, they've been able to keep it in culture continually so that it does not senesce. So we might have some idea of, of uh, get some handle on the regeneration and the uh, longevity capacities of this organism just by reading its genome. So very, very promising in terms of what we can have there. And then some of you may know what this organism is. It's uh, could be, should be the mascot of all invertebrates, right? The, the cuddly, uh, water bear or tardigrade. And uh, this has some interesting aspects. They've tried to look at its genome. Can't, you can't uh, hug it though, because it's only uh, a very few millimeters in size, but it is aquatic and uh, pretty cute looking. Um, so again, to highlight that the invertebrates is shown here in this table here, just make up an enormous amount of diversity, biodiversity on the planet. And uh, much of that biodiversity for the invertebrates, of course, is the insects. So people have known that the insects uh, have the most species on the planet, and we're not gonna focus on the insects. Um, there's an old saying, the uh, very famous quote by Darwin that he, that God must have loved beetles, right? Because he made so many species of beetles. And that's shown here, they have a million or so uh, that have been cataloged, that somebody's actually studied and named uh, an insect. But even if you just took away the, the, the insects, we still have thousands of marine invertebrates that uh, most people then have no clue what they, what they do um, and uh, what their associations are on these various habitats. 12,000 echinoderms, sea stars and brittle stars, uh, the flatworms here estimated to be 25,000. So we're just scratching the surface and this is again what Giga wants to do. We aim to visit our homepage. Uh, we, we, we have support here. We also have a Twitter feed, uh, which you can look at. So let me see here. How much more time do I have? I got a few minutes to continue on about deep end. Totally up to you. We are, it is 345, but if you have a couple more minutes, we're good. Okay, yeah. So I'll continue on with just uh, uh, one more study which we completed last year. It's called the Deep End Project. And this was a, a little bit uh, different for me. We learned a little bit of what's off of the, the benthos or the, the, the surface, the, the bottom of the ocean, but started looking at the pelagic. Um, and this turns out to be the largest, one of the largest habitats on the planet because the, the average depth of the ocean is about 14,000 feet. And you have all of this space here filled with water, uh, starting from the shallowest areas here, above 600 feet down to the depths. And that's is all, all these organisms. Now deep end started because of the, uh, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which we're now at the 10 year anniversary, the uh, worst oil spill in US history, um, created uh, this slick and uh, damaged a lot of underwater habitats. We lost 11. Uh, uh, platform workers, and then thousands of uh, gallons that were spilled. You can look at the uh, at kind of details of the spill in this, this book. 
Bottom of the Ocean, got some movies. And um, the, uh, the only, you know, the only silver lining of the, of the uh, one of the silver lines of the accident was that more money and funding and attention went to the Gulf of Mexico. So that was, that was one thing that at least we learned something from that. And the Deep End Project, which was led by Tracy Sutton, one of our, um, our fish biologists here at NOVA, uh, led this, this one project to look at the pelagic. So we have uh, a lot of uh, great colleagues who put together, who, who, put, uh, who uh, contributed to Deep End. And then our aspect for Deep End was actually uh, mostly on the, uh, the microbial side again. So this was kind of our focus here to add to others who were studying the, uh, the other fauna and, and fish and uh, the trophic levels and the connections between these organisms. We started at the, uh, the bottom of the food web there, at the base of the food web, look at the microbes. Um, of course, we learned a lot of physical oceanography uh, of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Matt Johnston, one of our, uh, our scientists was able to do modeling and this was an important aspect because you have the, the deep water rising up here. We actually got lucky during that oil spill that not a lot of oil was funneled around and spread to the coral reefs on the east coast of Florida. Here again uh, is this aspect that the deep water of uh, the Gulf of Mexico is a large habitat. And uh, this is a cool uh, kind of a slide showing the uh, asked that the Gulf of Mexico is actually a very deep water habitat. So I'm just going to skip real quick to a study that was kind of linking the microbes to uh, the invertebrates in the deep, in the deep water horizon uh, uh, deep end project. And I had one student who just finished up a master's this year studying the pyrosome. And so here you see a pyrosome, uh, very common in certain cases, it's going to have lots of blooms at uh, certain times of the year in the Gulf. It's bioluminescent, and uh, it's been studied and and but kind of uh, not very uh, not very well known in terms of uh, all of its biology. But it's a, a pelagic tunicate, so one of a specific lineage there of ascidians and. The uh, luminescence is thought to believe, it's thought to originate from a specific organ within a single zoid. So as a colonial tunicate, there's hundreds of zoids that uh, make up an individual as shown here, it's filtering, uh, but the whole organism itself lights up. And uh, again, it's an animal. Um, and the big question that we wanted to figure out from the studies and the collections through Deep End was what was the basis of its bioluminescence? And bioluminescence is uh, the creation of light from a, uh, a biological source. And it turns out that many different organisms uh, that live on uh, live in the ocean can create bioluminescence. So it's it's appeared several times throughout evolution. This is a uh, one. One process here, which is created by bacteria, it'll take uh, ATP in a form of energy. It'll convert this process, but there's also animal forms of evolution, phosphors that can be created. And the amount of bioluminescence that, that occurs throughout different lineages is pretty astounding. And I learned, learned a lot through that. So just to jump to the, uh, the final case here is that uh, Lex, uh, Alexis Berger, who carried out this master's project, was able to use microbial probes to, uh, to localize the potential source of bioluminescence in the, uh, the pyrosome. And this is shown here using, again, very specific probes. This is the light organ itself. And uh, we found very specific, what's called hybridization, uh, a type of fishing technique. Uh, and it localized exactly to the spot and no other place in the, in the pyrosome. Um, this was also linked to mitochondria using electron microscopy. She found uh, uh, mitochondria closely associated and the microbes themselves, a photo, type of photobacterium was intracellular uh, in this organelle. So the uh, overall 
picture here is that we probably located a photobacterium symbiont within the zoid, and this could most likely be responsible for 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 um, for what's uh, is called bioluminescence in this um, animal. So um, I have one more thing here. One more project is the uh, the anglerfish, and we also looked at bioluminescence from this anglerfish. Was characterized as part of the deep end project, and uh, we use 16S microorganisms to study this uh, this anglerfish. Some of you might have known the anglerfish is something that lives uh, mostly in that darkness in the abyss, and uh, this is one you might have seen. This is a, the female is the larger organism, and then a male attaches uh, to that because mates can be hard to find in the deep ocean. So. Once you grab one, you know, you want to hang on. Um, she carried out this study using molecular techniques and we identified this particular microbe that lived with the, uh, with the anglerfish in the uh, particular species here. So actually, I think I'm going to stop there. I want to leave a little bit of time if there's any questions. I know I went over uh, quite a lot and... Uh, <laughs> We do more. have a couple questions. Um, the first one is, is it true that we've only explored about 5% of the ocean? Do you believe we should be focusing our efforts more on learning about the ocean rather than outer space? Yes, I, I think so. Um, we, I don't know the exact percentage, but um, as I showed just kind of this snapshot here, there's a lot more we can learn and um, if you just look at the budgets, and I learned this from Tracy and Edie Witter, who, uh, who do a lot of deep sea research. I mean, and I think it still holds true. You know, the NOAA budget is 10% you know, of the NASA budget. And you know, I'm not saying anything against the NASA budget or space exploration, but when you just look at the, uh, the amount of space, and now we have private industries, which is fine. You know, you have... Uh, uh, Blue Horizons and uh, Elon Musk, SpaceX, they're putting in their own money and uh, we want to continue to explore there. But just think if we had put in just another uh, another amount of a slug of funding into the oceans and protecting that. Instead, what we're seeing is a lot of deep sea mining, which is going to destroy a lot of the, the benthic habitats before we've even studied them because we're trying to mine for minerals. And um, so there's a bit of an imbalance there. So we want to go into space, uh, which takes you know, billions of dollars when there's probably very little life there as we know it. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's worth a debate. Awesome. All right. And the next question, do the photosynthesizing organisms like the sea slug actually photosynthesize themselves? Or is it the zooxanthellae in algae where it's happening inside them and helping them, uh, but actually being done by a different organism? In the case of the sea slug, the solar powered sea slug, that's, the, that's all the uh, chloroplasts of the algae. So they can't photosynthesize. They need those chloroplasts, which they consume and then incorporate. Um, same thing with corals. They don't actually actively feed, but uh, the algae kind of find their way into the tissue uh, and uh, incorporate themselves because of a very close association. But the uh, sea slugs have to search for that algae and then and then use it but it's, so it's not really totally obligate um they could probably live off of uh what they prey but it does help them um we get through the the dry spell when they can't find can't feed <laughs> wouldn't that be good wouldn't it be nice to have you'd be able to like a just kind right? of split the switch yeah and, well i'm photosynthesizing yeah <laughs> I, I'll work on it. I'll let you know if I have any luck, but that would solve a lot of my problems, I think. Yeah. A lot <laughs> of us start okay. crazy too, right? You know, we like salad and eat but man, you haven't made that switch <laughs> to the <laughs> green lifestyle. <laughs> All right. What skills would you recommend participants interested in the genomics field start to acquire or learn? Or um, do you have any recommendations for hands-on experience? Uh, so your first question about skills is, uh, um, computation. Uh, so that's one of the things that's going to be needed if you're going to do genetics. We're, we're generating a lot more data, what we call big data, 
So it requires some familiarity and uh, comfort with handling data sets, uh, what we call kind of uh, line commands, because so far right now, you still have to use line commands like Unix, uh, Python to handle the big data sets. We haven't got to the stage uh, where, uh, you know, using GUIs and graphic interfaces are more common. But if you're doing real data analysis, you need those, those line commands are, um, and it's constantly changing. So you just have to be uh, flexible, uh, but get those basics there uh, for, for programming, database analysis. We're gonna need the visualization uh, techniques is also good because we have big data. How do we best find the trends and the patterns? That's gonna be important. And then for biology, because it'd be nice if you have both skills, if you uh, focus in on a particular group that you uh, are really passionate about, you know, what is it, what is it about that organism uh, that you find interesting? You know? So I tried to show several different organisms here, uh, just mostly on the invertebrates, but you know, we have to know a little bit of biology and genetics. So you wanna get those basics down. Awesome. And are those water bears really as indestructible as they say? Um, do, it, do scientists know why they are so hardy? And what are their closest living relatives? Those are three cool. parts in one. <laughs> uh, um, uh, you might have stumped me there. Uh, I don't really know the tardigrades that well. Um, as far as I know, I, I mean, just uh, some of those early studies, they've They've done some uh, some studies on desiccation, mm -hmm. and uh, they seem to be resistant to to radiation. Yeah, and they seem to survive. And and then wasn't there this? Uh, they did try to send some to the moon, and there was a crash landing. So yes, they might already be on the on the moon, right? <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure they're fine because they can handle most environments. So I feel like they're probably enjoying their time up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we might come go back there and you see thriving community. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know. Yeah, there's there's interesting uh, organisms that just seem hardy. It's yeah. just their constitution. There's an or a microbe called Dinococcus, which um, they can be exposed to really high amounts of of uh, radiation, and uh, their genomes get blasted because uh, radiation generally ionizing radiation is not good for your DNA. So it breaks it up and breaks the helix up, but then uh, they come back. And for some reason that this, the, uh, the Dinococcus can re uh, constitute itself in its genome and still survive. So just, if it has that machinery through evolution. It's uh, it might, might have that, that capacity. Thanks. All right, and the final question, do you propose that the same symbiotic organism causes bioluminescence in all organisms that present with it, or is it different for different species? Um, yeah, I didn't get to go into the, uh, our anglerfish study, but um, I, what the evidence is showing is that there's different types of photobacterium, or um, we found a, what's called an enterovibrio, so they're not the same species. What we'll probably see is that um, very maybe closely related species that have that bioluminescence capacity uh, might find specific hosts, so they adapt to that host. And then there's some that are more uh, cosmopolitan, and uh, and they can live in different hosts that can uh, accommodate them. But um, we also see that bioluminescence occurs several times in evolution, so uh, there's an adaptation there in multiple ways for bioluminescence to happen. It's a, it's a pretty cool phenomenon. I just didn't know how widespread it was. It's just, again, most people don't get down into, into the deep, you know, and so, so much we can learn there. Um, I didn't get my video to go, you know, just to kind of show this really cool phenomenon that uh, E. Witter put together. Let me see if I got it right here. And um, that bioluminescence is, again, just so common and uh, yes she used what was called this a splat screen and uh, when she would go take the sub down it would just uh -oh. get in darkness without scaring the organism just see what was captured on this this screen and uh, 
you know, when you touch it, touch these organisms, then you can see the outline of it. So that was the cool thing. You see this outline and you can see everything that these are all, this is all just bioluminescence. And so, so the various types of organisms that can carry it out is just amazing. And from various ways, sometimes bacterial or a non-bacterial source. Um, this is a picture of, um, uh, this is the bobtail squid here. Oh, cool. And uh, we know about that. For, it's a Vibrio species, which actually is taken from the environment and it populates that squid um, horizontally, right? So it, it just, sometimes the squid will just take it and, and it will be moved and then the bacteria will come back and forth uh, on a daily basis. You know, so it repopulates it. So there's another association there with bioluminescence. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lopez. This was really, really cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Uh, my mind is blown. I was, as you were type, as you were talking, I was like writing down all these things that I'm like, all right, I'm going to look this up later, <laughs> this up later. So thank you. Cause now I get You're welcome. to do. <laughs> um, Maybe next time we'll have a, Ooh, sorry. More on the, we'll have more on the algal blooms next time. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. That one. Yeah. That one I'm intrigued about as well. All right. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, as always, we record these. It will take us a couple days to edit it and post it to our YouTube channel. Uh, but in the meantime, we will be having another one this Thursday at 3 p.m. with Tracy Dean from Conservation Florida. And she'll be talking to us about her work um, fostering strategic partnerships, engaging the community, and facilitating large scale land transactions. So thank you guys. I hope everyone had a great time. Thanks again, Dr. Lopez. And we will see you Thanks, next Charlie. See you guys. Bye. Bye.